you've been studying resilience professionally for a number of years, but you also have a very personal connection to this kind of work, uh, to being resilient, or it might be more fair to say to not being resilient. <laughs> can you can you talk about your personal experience with resilience and why this work is so important to you? Yes, and I definitely do not take that as an insult. Uh, the way I look at this, this, Ramian, is that it's a lot easier to, I think, facilitate conversations about being more resilient and understanding what resilience is if it doesn't come naturally to you. And it really didn't come naturally to me and, and still, for the most part, doesn't. Um, you know, I think if you look at it from a couple of different perspectives, uh, in my life earlier, I, was, I played college football. And there's a lot of evidence of my lack of resilience in the way that I thought about the games and the way I reacted to throwing interceptions or incompletions and coming off the field with my head down. And that affected my future performance from a personal standpoint. Uh, not being resilient affected the way that I connected to other people in romantic relationships, family, friends. And then in business, uh, you know, you have to sell yourself. And I was actually in a pure sales position where every no just knocked me down and took away my energy. And all of these things over the course of the first 30 plus years of my life were clues to that something could be better. I wasn't doing things in the manner that I think was as effective as possible. So it sounds like you were able to take those painful experiences and make something really productive and good come out of them. Um, I appreciate that. Let's talk about your definition of resilience. A lot of the definitions that we've seen talk about resilience as bouncing back from adversity. But for you, that's only the beginning of the definition. How do you define resilience? I think it's a richer, deeper concept than just bouncing back. And I think bouncing back certainly is a part of it. I think it's becoming uh, aware enough to embrace things like failure, so your ability to learn from them, to be motivated by challenges, and to have the opportunity to make meaningful connections with other people. Excellent. Can you talk a little bit about what gets in the way of people being more resilient? Ramian, this is a little bit of a loaded question, and one that, that I get a lot, and one I also put a lot of thinking into. First of all, there's your personal reaction and your own personal history. Uh, your, again, your innate personality. It's the way that your parents, your caregivers when you were a child may have spoken to you, encouraged you, or didn't encourage you. It could be, uh, as we've uh, all experienced, this proliferation of always on in our culture. Um, we are almost never separated from our work, from people who are thousands and thousands of miles away, from insults, from bad news, things like that. And then, of course, um, with that technology, uh, we're, I think we're struggling with things like work-life balance because the lines have really blurred, so our minds don't shut off. I remember uh, sitting down for family dinners, and my dad would walk in the door and we would have a family dinner, and my dad didn't look down at his lap to check his iPhone or his, you know, his Samsung phone. Uh, he was present. He was with us, and our family activities took precedence. Whereas now, things are beeping all around us, and we've also got things like 24-hour news. Um, and I'm really dating myself now, but that wasn't even a thing when I was a kid either. I appreciate that. Um... And even though we may be born with a certain capacity or proclivity towards resilience, you make it clear that it's possible for us to develop our ability to become more resilient. And in your description of how we can do that, you spend a lot of time talking about the value of writing and journaling. Can you talk in particular what it looks like to build your resilience muscles and how writing and journaling may play a part in that? Yeah, uh, good question again, Ramian. And I would say that journaling is one of several dozens of things that we can do to be more resilient. And in fact, in uh, in the book, uh, at the end of every chapter, my goal was to to 
write down anywhere between 10 to 15 science-backed ways that you could build your resilience. And I also want to call to your attention and to everybody involved in this uh, this conference is the idea that when you do just one little thing every day, if you create a habit, you can get closer to your goal, right? It's it's kind of that compound interest, right? Just get 1% better every day. Um, and when it comes to journaling, though, in particular, that that is a favorite of mine. And uh, it, it's based off the work of uh, James Pennebaker from the University of Texas, who was really intrigued by, uh, I think it was a niece of his who was writing in a diary. And of course, being a scientist himself, he said, hey, I wonder if that's good for her. I wonder if it's good for us. And over the course of 30 years or so, running a dozens of experiments, what he found is that when we journal about our deepest, darkest emotions and our our more positive emotions. We just write about our emotions and our daily experiences for three or four days, for 15 or 20 minutes at a time without inhibiting at all. We find that there are positive impacts on our, uh, our well-being, our, uh, how we measure things like depression, uh, how we get over things like a layoff and bad news and adversity. So it's a tool that I go to because what eventually happens over time when we journal is that we start to untangle the difficult things that have happened. We put language to them so that there's order as opposed to all these crazy thoughts going through our heads that are overwhelming to us. And it's almost as if we're taking a USB drive and we're downloading some of that really deep negativity and saying, all right, I'm, I've done it. I've talked about it. Uh, I'm now moving on. It's really helpful to hear that, Doug. Two things strike me. One, I'm remembering a quote, although I can't remember to whom it's attributed, that uh, you can handle any situation if you're willing to handle any emotion that comes with that situation. And um, I know that sometimes people don't think of engineering work as being emotional, but I argue anything that involves you putting a lot of yourself into it and involves the possibility of being right or being wrong involves some level of emotion. Um, yeah. The other thing that occurs to me is really a question. It's uh, I get the value of writing and journaling. I am somebody who likes to keep score, and I'd like to know if I'm making progress. How would I know if I'm becoming more resilient, if I'm developing my resilience muscles? What does progress look like? Yeah, that's a really good question, Raymond. And I would say I'm I'm a scorekeeper myself. So I like to track things that I do on a daily basis. I've got a habit tracker on my phone for, um, you know, do I get my 10,000 steps in? Um, have I done something to advance my podcast? Uh, have I ri I'm writing another book. So have I written, you know, 100 words or 200 words that day? Things like that. Have I exercised? Um, so there's there's a there's a long term answer and a short term and I would say the long term is um, look back uh, in six months and just take account. Uh, uh, you are you're the best judge of you. You're, you're going to know. So that's that's a simple answer. The the day to day answer is I think that there's something you could do when you think about what it may be where you want to put some effort into resilience. Let's just say you want to improve relationships. You want to improve your reaction to adversity. You want to not necessarily get rid of um, a little bit of sadness and a little bit of anxiety, but you want to dampen it so that you're still effective in difficult situations. What you could do is journal just a little bit at the end of each day with maybe a number or two and a sentence or two about how you did on each of those elements. Give yourself a score, one to five, one to 10, what you wanna do, and then go back, I would say, maybe every month and start to look at these things. You could put them in a spreadsheet, and of course there's all types of calculations you could do at that point. Uh, but I'm a, I'm a big fan of just tracking what you're thinking about and then going back and taking a quick look and, and a diagnosis of what may be causing these things. I like this idea of tracking how um, effective I'm am at dealing with difficult situations, uh, which also brings up another question. In, in reading your work, I was a little bit disappointed and frustrated when um, 
I saw that you said that being more resilient won't necessarily mean that you um, are, deal with life or deal with less stress in life. That being more resilient doesn't mean that you're going to avoid distress. Um, I almost put the book down and walked away. Can Can you talk mm -hmm. about why there is not a connection like that? Why won't being resilient make you feel less stressed? So uh, there's a couple of things to unpack in that question. Um, first of all, thank you for almost putting the book down and not reading it. I, I appreciate your candor. Um, but it brings me to a story about my son, my, my son who actually, who, the one that went to space camp, uh, will hopefully be working side by side with you in a couple of years. He um, had uh, a medical condition where I think it was once a month we had to go get some blood drawn from him. And for anybody out there that has kids, you know that they're not huge fans of needles right? So uh, typically the we would wait for him to get home from school and then I had to go get his blood drawn at say 4 o'clock or 4.30 or something. And um, he had to get in the car. And instead of telling him, hey, we're going to go get some ice cream or I'm taking you for a ride, I would tell him about 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the afternoon sometimes, hey, hey Nick, I just want to let you know we've got to go and get some blood drawn today. And of course, the reaction was tears sometimes, anger, but he trusted me and he knew that I was being realistic. And I think that that's a big part of why I talk about the idea that resilience doesn't get rid of anxiety and adversity in your life and so forth. What it does is allows you to be effective through these things. In my life, in your life, I, I hate to say this, we're all going to face um, difficulty, that doesn't go away. The reality of life doesn't change. We're going to have budget cuts. We're going to have a new manager who we just don't get along with. And being more resilient gives us the ability to learn new skills to deal with these things more effectively. Uh, thank you. Thank you for saying that. Um, it's hard to hear, but helpful. Nice. Um, <laughs> Another theme that comes up in your work is the idea of being present. And it comes up a number of times, uh, in particular in opposition to being distracted or multitasking. And this idea of being present has come up in other interviews we've done for the Virtual PM Challenge. Um, for example, NASA engineers and project managers, they make decisions and solve problems in the present, but they use lessons learned from the past and their imagination about future possibilities abilities to do that work in the present. Can you talk about the connection, the relationship between being present and being resilient? Yeah, I believe that we, and the research backs this up, that we spend something like 50% of our time either worrying about the past or contemplating the future. And, and Unfortunately, too infrequently, we are in the present moment. And the research also is pretty clear that when we're in the present moment, we're happier, we're more resilient, we're in a state of, of you know, being more satisfied with our lives. And we miss things. And in fact, another story, I remember being at Disney World uh, probably about 20 years ago, and there was, uh, we were right in front of Cinderella's castle, and there was a uh, what looked like a mother and her small child, and the child was eating a big vanilla ice cream cone, and the mother was on her BlackBerry. So she was someplace else. She was not in that moment. She was not able to take in the blue, the puffy white clouds and the blue sky and this wonderful place that they were in in this moment. And I believe that engineers and everybody, the, the better able that we are, the more that we're capable of being in the present moment, the more able we are to see our own emotions and how they may be affecting our decisions. We're able to read the room and demonstrate empathy to somebody who may be anxious and who has a good idea. We may need to pause for a moment and say, you know, Ramian, I noticed you haven't spoken up on this topic yet and you normally have, a, have some really good ideas. What's on your mind? So I think when we get too concerned about the past or the future, we miss out what's ha on what's happening right now and all the cues and the wonderful things that go with that. Yeah, there's, there's data in the present that we're ignoring. Yes. Uh, Doug, 
I want to thank you again for making time to talk to us today about resilience and your work with it. Um, I'm sure that our audience found a number of tips that are valuable. We'll give them a link to your book if they want to learn some more about your work. But thank you again for joining us today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I really enjoyed our conversation.